Good morning. And it you is get any sleep morning. this week? I did. I slept good oh. last night. Oh, that's a change. I think I've hit my eight hour goal all week. Whoa, that's pretty know, impressive. Right? My health app is very happy with me right now. Yeah. We'll just jump in. We have Mike Delasio with us this week. Jason is not here, but we've replaced him with Mike. So I think it'll be a good time. A uh, lower quality Mike. copy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll find out by the end of this, won't we? Hi, everybody. Do you want to give an introduction? Sure. My name is Mike D'Alessio. I've been a Rubyist since 2006 or 2007 or so. I've worked at Pivotal Labs. I worked on Cloud Foundry, which started as a Ruby project and evolved over time. I worked for Shopify for a while, helping lead their Ruby and Rails infrastructure team. That's the team that worked on YJIT and the Prism Parser and some other really exciting projects. And so at least the last five years or so have been me watching people do great Ruby up close, but maybe not me doing Ruby myself. And then I resigned from Shopify earlier this year because I'm thinking about just going back to work as an engineer and leaving management behind because that's really what has brought joy to me over the last decade or so. And so this summer was a little bit of an experiment for me to try doing open source full time. Do I still have the chops? What's the latest and greatest editor features? <laughs> and so I'm feeling a lot more comfortable about being able to sit down and write code six, eight hours a day now and heading into maybe a job search soon. We'll see. When you started, what version of Ruby was that? Oh, it was the one true Ruby. It was 186. Yeah. 186. Yep. Okay. I don't know if I ever used that. What was it? 187 was the very last. When I joined, it was around 2010 or so, and it was getting into 193, and they're talking about the new hash syntax for two and whatnot. So you were early days. Were you doing Rails? So I was doing Rails. So the big motivator for me at the time was I had just joined a startup that was operating power generators, which is like, ooh, that's a really boring industry. But they needed a way to basically tell the operators when to pull the lever and like when to regenerating and how much. So there's a bunch of math that has to go on in the background. But then at the end of the day, it was just a website that I was updating in real time numbers to tell the operators when to pull the lever. And that was my first production Rails app. That was in 2008-ish. Yeah. That's wild. How did you stumble into that? I had a friend from college who had a PhD in engineering and got involved in the energy industry. And he was like, we need somebody who can build us this energy trading platform. Can you do that? I would love to try. Sure. And of course, I was also the guy who was replacing the paper in the printer and running Cat5 through the generators and flushing queens. So it was pretty interesting. So where did that lead you to next? I guess the interesting bit is when I was there is when I started to get involved with open source in Ruby. So we were scraping a lot of data off of the power industry in the US is a little weird. I won't get into that because that's not your demographic, but <laughs> we ended up having to scrape a lot of XML or HTML data in order to figure out what are power prices today. And so there was a lot of broken HTML. And so I was using HPercot at the time, which didn't do a great job at fixing up broken markup. And I was stalking Aaron on the internet, as everybody does at one point in time. Everybody stalks Tenderlove. I had sent a couple of pull requests to Mechanize for client-side certificates. And I was like, hey, man, I see that you have this secret project on GitHub that you haven't told anybody about yet that looks like you're going to be parsing XML. Can I help with that? And he was like, yes. And that's how I got really involved in open source and Ruby was through Nokugiri and through Mechanize, which is like a headless web scraper. Yeah, I was going to say you should describe that because I've used that a long time ago in the past. I think it my first job like at an agency i can't remember what we were scraping or whatever but that was definitely something i used back then and it works great it's a lovely little tool it's based on a Perl project of the same name and all of the seattle rb cats basically went and implemented that same api for ruby and it's just great especially if there's no javascript and you just need to scrape the actual html it's a fantastic tool and it uses nokagiri under the hood now 
this whole stack gets built up on top of basically XML or HTML parsing, which that's been my bread and butter. I've worked at that level of the stack my whole career. So, so that answers the question of how did you get into doing all of the stuff with sanitizing and whatnot, which was what originally spawned us having you on the podcast to talk right. about sanitizing. But there's so many other projects too, like SQL or SQLite that you're working on as well. And people probably know you mostly around the HTML sanitizing guy. That, so if I they know me at all, sure. Well, yeah. that's right. always where I saw your face pop up around those conversations and GitHub issues and stuff. So right. that's probably the impetus to lead you in to that direction, I guess. Yeah. So like Liam Neeson said, I have a very particular set of skills. <laughs> So in one of the podcasts you did in July, you were talking about all the text editors and the fact that the sanitizer doesn't always do what you want it to and you have to add tags to it. I was, oh, I heard you talked about the thing that I do. I'd love to chat about it a little bit more, but that was kind of the intro into this podcast, right? So yeah. were there particular questions that you had or I can just dive in too? I might just have you dive in, but to recap what we were talking about previously, I think I was talking about action text and the sanitizing in Rails, it's got basically two arrays. One is the tags that are allowed, and the other is the attributes that are allowed. That's right. There's no combination of both where you mm -hmm. can say, like, an image tag is allowed to have a source, but nothing else yeah. is allowed to have a source. And so that was one of the things that I had always found kind of strange. What I'm adding to this, I guess I'm adding this attribute, and it's allowed anywhere, but that's maybe a little less than ideal. When you're thinking about sanitizing in general, you're like, I want to be very specific about what we allow because that's the whole point. We're trying to make this yeah. safe and whatever. So yeah. that was maybe a good place to start and yeah. talk sure. about how that works. Yeah. So the API that you talked about, which is the sanitizer has an array of tags that are allowed and an array of attributes that are allowed. That's not really how HTML works, right? Because you could have the same attribute and it might have two different meanings under two different tags. And the sanitizer doesn't really support more complicated things. And that's for historical reasons. So the sanitizer that's in Rails goes all the way back to a wiki that was built in the mid 2000s. That was essentially that whole security sanitizer subsystem was pulled out and dropped into Rails. And it was doing a lot with regular expressions, which in the mid-2000s, I guess, was fine. But we are more enlightened people now. And we know that you actually need to parse parse the HTML in order to sanitize it properly. Well, I think it was Primogen was going through the CrowdStrike breakdown and it was regex related or oh, for yep. part of it or something. I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> so if you dig deep enough, it's always <laughs> regexes or DNS, right? Yes. Yep. <laughs> That got put into Rails, and right. it was still early days of how do we do this or right. whatever back then. And so right. that's probably a lot of backwards compatibility, trying to make sure that yeah. things continue on still safely. Yeah, that sanitizer API hasn't meaningfully changed since 2006, I think, 2007. It's a really old API. And what happened sometime in the mid-20-teens was there were a bunch of... CVEs, like vulnerabilities that people found in that old sanitizer regex engine. And what the Rails team did at the time, unbeknownst to me, was they looked around for a library that would help them implement the sanitizer. And they found Lufa, which is another library that I co-wrote with Brian Helmkamp back in the day. Brian was working at WePlay, which I don't know if anybody remembers WePlay anymore, but it was a site for kids sports. Like, oh, you have a softball team. And you want to organize your softball team and you want to comment on how people did on the game. So like, people were commenting. And, and so there was some untrusted data being fed into the system and he needed a good sanitizer. And so we collaborated to build this thing, Lufa. And Lufa, we call it Lufa because you're going to scrub your data. It's like a pun, right? Okay. <laughs> I love it. This was, I think, Raphael and Casper on the Rails team found Lufa and they were like, this is close enough. We're going to use this and we're not going to tell Mike about it. So they just started re-implementing <laughs> the rail sanitizer on top of Lufa. They couldn't really talk about it publicly because they were working on a whole set of CVEs. Then they released that the next version of Rails and they were like, hey, Mike, we're using your thing. 
I started getting bug reports and feature requests in on Lufa, and I was like, where did this come from? And it's because now I'm a dependency of Rails somehow. So fast forward a little bit, Lufa has a really strong opinion on what tags and attributes should be allowed. And that comes from, we looked at the HTML spec. Well, which ones can have JavaScript in them or which ones can modify the DOM in interesting ways? Let's turn those off. So the the allow list was based on us basically saying, well, if it's not on the allow list, it's because we either don't know about it or we didn't look at it or because we know that it is possibly dangerous. So it has a really strong opinion. And that's meant to be an out-of-the-box solution. But Rails doesn't work that way, right? The API already allowed you to allow tags or attributes. And so it wasn't a great fit. And the Rails team wound up re-implementing big chunks of Lufa inside Rails. Problem number one is now we've got code that's mostly the same, but has small changes, and they started to evolve. I would fix something in Lufa, and Rails would not get that fix until six months later when someone re-reported it for Rails, for example. The reason they had to re-implement things is because Lufa wasn't a great fit for Rails. Because again, Lufa had a strong opinion, and Rails has no opinion, basically. There's a default set, but the API says you can override that. But there's another gem that's really lovely by Ryan Grove called Sanitize. And this has been around for, I think, a good eight years. And it does exactly what you just asked about, which is I want to specify this attribute is okay, but only when it's on this tag. So you can have a href is totally fine, but a linked href is not okay. For example, like I'm just imagining a scenario. And so I reached out to Ryan quietly a couple of years ago and I was like, hey, just to let you know, I'm looking at Sanitize. I think I want to swap Lufa out and bring in Sanitize. Are you okay being a surprise dependency of Rails all of a sudden? Because no one did me that kindness back in the day. I figured I would, <laughs> I was I would lean say. in. And his response was really interesting. And this is the, actually point number two that I want to get into with you. He says, well, I really regret designing it so that people could specify their own allow lists because it's been nothing Ooh. but a headache. Okay. And so again, Lufa had a strong opinion because we looked at the HTML spec and we looked at DOM purify and existing tools and tried to curate that allow list. Why do people want to change that list? What is the use case? Can you all talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I can probably look it up real quick too. What I had to add to our allow list. So one of the things that I implemented in Jumpstart was adding... O embed. So like in Basecamp, in tricks, you can paste in a link and it'll be like, oh, that's a Twitter link. Do you just want to embed the tweet instead? So it would hit the O embed endpoint, give it the URL to the tweet, which would give me back HTML that was officially from Twitter. And then I wanted to be able to have that embedded or whatever. And there's a couple other situations of things like that, but I can't remember exactly. I was just thinking the turbo frame could have a source on it and it's not an image, but it's a similar conceptual thing mm -hmm. or whatever. And if you allow source, then it makes sense or whatever to be just generally allowed, probably so long as the JavaScript or whatever implements that feature, treats yeah. that and handles it safely or whatever. So I can imagine having a scrubber of some kind be smart enough to say, we don't want to allow embeds at all, unless the URL is twitter.com and yeah, allow that. Sure. And that would be an option. I can imagine maybe having a plugin that allow me to do common embeds or something. I is just that the kind of feature up, you're talking about? Yeah, I think so. So I just pulled up the, and this was all O-embed related. I add to the allowed tags. We have the action text allow tags. Mm -hmm. And then we add in iframe script, block quote, and time because those are coming from O-embed, where normally you wouldn't want to mm -hmm. do the script in there. And so that's something that I've been like, well, we use it for this purpose because we're like the Twitter embed is HTML plus the script tag so that you can download the Twitter thing to style it and add the functionality and stuff like the follow button or whatever they want to embed in there. Well, we could use the embed stuff. However, if we didn't allow script tag, it's just going to embed some HTML that's unstyled, doesn't do anything. 
and doesn't quite get the Owen bed kind of magic that you were shooting for there. And then that goes through action tech. So we've got to make sure the sanitizer handles that and stuff, but it's not really what you want. I would say in that case, sanitizing is about making untrusted content safe. I guess what I'm asking is in that case, you have someone who is probably trusted who's using action text to create part of your site. Is that really untrusted? Should action text have a trusted versus untrusted mode? And that way things just mm. get through? Well, in general, I don't want anybody else to be able to put a script tag in there. Right. So right. if it comes from you, it's trusted and you can do whatever you yeah. want. And from other folks, you yeah. can't let JavaScript through, you can't let iframes through. Yep. Which is kind of potentially a two step process of you can sanitize the user content and then afterwards, we could replace the embed for Twitter with our own. And that's the trusted step afterwards or something like that. That's what we do. We use a third party service to embed those types of things. So it's not them just embedding the thing directly in our thing. We use another service. Yep. I put the list of our allow list in the chat, but we use figure turbo frames, the SVG related tags. Mm-hmm. And then we specifically use SVG sanitization because there's a whole lot of vulnerabilities with SVGs if you really dig into those. Yeah, there is. There's actually a whole gem that just sanitizes SVGs. That I think we, that's we, used, we, use. we used to Shopify. Yeah. Dang. That should probably get what pulled are, into Rails too. I should probably look into that. For anybody that's not familiar, what are some of the ways you can do that? Because most expectations, mm-hmm. it is a XML markup for an SVG, but... I think the big thing is a lot of the attributes allow JavaScript. A really? lot of them. Yeah. So you can do animated SVGs. You can oh, create a circle sure. and then have it run around in a square pattern or something. And the, those motion attributes, there's a lot of them. And so you essentially need a whole other set of allowed attributes for SVG. And then like you risk breaking some of the SVG. Like if you want SVG, why wouldn't you allow the animation as well? And so it ends up being this really hard line to follow. I don't know that much about it, which is why I need to take a look at that library. I've done printing work in the past, and there's even more than just that. I can't remember the specifics, but I'm pretty sure there's some weird vulnerabilities around the ability to like base 64 encode things in them. And it's a massive attack vector that you would never think of. Yeah. In the HTML parsers, it's a completely different mode. It's like there's HTML. And then when you see the SVG tag, all bets are off. And completely right. change how you parse things. So that gem is called Sanitize SVG, I think. If anybody in listening land wants to know. Yo, quick question for you. Do you want higher clarity into production, but don't have the time to become a wizard in observability? Honey Badger Insights is exactly what you need. Forget the old school trio of logs, metrics, and traces. We're talking structured events that don't just sit there. They're your treasure map to solving mysteries in your app. With Honey Badger, sling your logs and events into the mix and voila, you just unlock the power of Honey Badger's new query language, Badger QL. It's like having a conversation with your data. Ask it anything, turn mishaps into metrics, and showcase your wins on dashboards that even the marketing team will drill over. And guess what? This isn't just for big spenders. Honey Badger's got you covered with a free plan that packs a punch, including error tracking, uptime monitoring, sleek status pages, and more. Oh, and speaking of errors, Honey Badger treats them like VIPs at the club. With Insights and Badger QL, your errors aren't just problems, they're opportunities. Explore your data in ways you didn't think were possible and get the insights that you deserve. Check out HoneyBadger.io. That's right, HoneyBadger.io. Now that you've had all this experience with sanitizing, what's your ideal design for this? Because I like that where it's, look, You shouldn't be messing with this. We've done what is trusted. That's the whole point. You offload the expertise to the sanitizer. Don't mess with it. That makes a lot of sense to me. And then if you want to go do stuff afterwards or something, then you can inject your own HTML or whatever that's trusted. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So the Lufa gem was built to be very general purpose, as opposed to the sanitized gem, which is very specific. Sanitized gem is built around the allow lists. 
And Lufa is actually built around tree traversal. It uses Nogagiri to make sure that we've parsed the HTML properly into a tree. And then you create a class that's called a scrubber class. And its job is to essentially either top down or bottom up, traverse the tree and modify it along the way. And so the proof of concept in the gem was, and you can build the sanitizer out of it. Here you go with this strongly opinionated list. But you can actually build, people have contributed scrubbers that do things like add no follow attribute. Yeah. Rel. Yeah. Rel no rel? follow. Right. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. So you can do little things like that and you can do bigger things. It's obvious you see a script tag while you're traversing the tree, you can remove it. But along the way, we do other things like look at specific attributes and make sure that they're URL encoded, for example. So it's a really general purpose. And so it's completely possible, even using the Rails HTML sanitizer, to add in additional Lufa scrubbers and have those traverse the tree too. So if you wanted to do some post-processing, like you're talking about injecting an O-embed, you can totally do that with a Lufa scrubber with just a few lines of code. And then you can aggregate them as well. You could have a chain of scrubbers that all run on whatever your markup is. And so that gives an infinite degree of freedom to everybody, which may yeah. not always be what you want to reach for, but it's that's, in there. And maybe that's where we want to try to migrate I, the API. I read the first line of our initializer and didn't get any further than that. But we do right afterwards, we define a scrubber and it checks to see if the node is a script tag. And if it's not allowed in our allowed script list, remove the node and then the Lufa scrubber stop so that we move on from that or whatever. And that was our solution for that. The way we implemented the O embeds was we're using action text content or attachment tags or whatever. So Rails, before it gets to the sanitizer has already injected the O embed content in there, which means we can't add the script tags in afterwards. We've got to make sure that Lufa safely doesn't remove those while we're going through it or whatever. So that was our solution for it. I was just sitting here like, well, we're not actually just allowing all script tags or whatever. Surely we're not. Double checking it. Yeah. Oh yeah. We uh, make sure it's allowed url or source for that but no that's great so that's validating kind of what was in my head that we could really embrace extensible scrubbers and let people be a little more flexible yeah and i don't know if it makes any sense to build almost a little dsl for some of those things where it's allow these scripts and you give it a list of urls or a patterns or something even domains or something that you just allow or whatever but it is infinitely flexible now because you get the nodes and you can do whatever you want to with them. But it's also for maybe the common use cases or something like this, having a shortcut that's a predefined scrubber that you instantiate and it can just check the allowed list or something, then that could be something people grab off the shelf from you. You've already written it in a way that's going to work simply. And then me as the developer doesn't have to like, okay, how do scrubbers work? Okay, this is built on these Nokugiri nodes and I've got to learn the sub language to implement that. It could be interesting to have some of those higher level, but even just collecting a handful of those common actual cases that we want to officially support could be a nice way to help people walk through this stuff because it is... Riddled with minds, I feel like. Yeah, there's some conceptual compression that could be done there for sure. I'm going to use your words back to you, Chris. That's one of the favorite things that I've heard DHH say. That always stuck with me is the idea that, yes, it happens to use Nokugiri and even Lufa. This could be a feature that's added to Rails that doesn't even mention the words Lufa or something and could be just part of the API or docs or whatever that defined it on the Rails level and just happened to use a Lufa feature behind the scenes or something. But those are interesting because that's been, I imagine, sort of the problem that you're kind of tackling when you're working on a framework like this or any library really is how do we help the developers not have to worry about these details and 
abstracted away so that they can get on with their business. We don't get in their way. They're not making more bug reports for us to mess with. That's when you know that you've hit a decent interface for it when you like you see the issues and bug reports and questions kind of drop off. Well, well I'll tell you, honestly. part of the danger of having a podcast is that when you say software doesn't do what I need, it's public. And now I can come to you <laughs> and yeah. ask you about your specific use cases. The danger is you have to spend time with me, but the, no, the bonus I, is I'm probably going to solve your use case for you. I love so, it. Yeah. And so I'll definitely follow up with you about some ideas I have there. These are ones that are super fun. I love to hack on it together to figure out what makes sense. How do we do this? What are the other cases? And maybe get a commit or two into a project that to me feels like eh, sanitizing stuff. Leave that to Mike. He's the expert on it or whatever. But it's probably not that hard to contribute to once you find something like this that you're like, oh, actually, in the same vein of we are always testing against, as a lot of companies like Shopify, testing against Rails main, running the app against it so that you're prepared. Any deprecation warnings that come up, we can address them a year ahead of time or whatever. And that's been fun for us. I've found a whole ton of little things to contribute to Rails. Like the other day, we were doing the new in queuing jobs during a transaction, having that feature showed off in a screencast. And I go in the middle of the screencast, I turn on the flag and the initializer and it's still showing the bug. And I was like, this is strange. And it throws off my screencast a little bit. And turns out that the variable in the Rails engine was being set before the initializers run. So it never actually listened to whatever the initializer set. And Every time I try to do something in the initializer, I do that. I'm doing it in the <laughs> wrong order. I'm glad I'm not the only one. It happens to all of us. And it's a tricky little process to get right. It's been fun to find those things and be able to contribute back to stuff that I have used for years. So I'd love to hack on some ideas and stuff with you on, yeah, on this. That'd be great. At RailsConf earlier this year, we did the hack day. And I had a couple of people sit down at my table and I got some PRs from folks to build new scrubbers for things. So there's a PR for a scrubber that fixes up white space when you have HTML and you just want to print it as normal text. If you oh, know, I can imagine cool. you might want to do this if you have an SMS, you just want to convert it from HTML into something that can be sent as a text and it fixes up the white space in the particular way that they wanted. So it's not that hard to contribute, I think, to Lufa because the surface area of the API is so small. So I'd love to work with you on it. That's awesome. Question I have for you is there's the Rails HTML sanitizer library and Lufa. What's the difference? What are their jobs or whatever? Yeah. So Lufa, again, had a really strong opinion about just how do you make untrusted HTML safe? And it maybe overcorrects in some places, but it also undercorrects in some places. So an example of undercorrecting is it lets attributes through that are like data dash attributes. But Rails has special behavior for many of these data dash attributes. And so they actually, if you look at the Rails HTML sanitizer, so they're subclassing a Lufa scrubber. Mm. And then they have additional behaviors that they built in, like extra logic around which data attributes go through. And there's also some other just rough edges around what do you do with Boolean attributes? That's maybe more historical than anything else. But And so I have a long-lived branch that's trying to rationalize some of those behavioral differences. And ideally, what I want is I want Lufa to have an API. That then if you implement a scrubber, you can do this kind of thing a little bit more easily and you don't need to re-implement a whole method. That's mainly the difference is Rails HTML Sanitizer has that historical API and then they're doing some Rails-specific behaviors as well. Okay. And I remember, wasn't there a time where there's the HTML4 Sanitizer and when was that and what was the cause of all that? Because I remember being on the sidelines as more of a Rails newbie, and I had no idea what was going on, but I was so oh, cool. There's new improvements going on on this, and I don't know any of the details, but I'm glad that somebody's working on it and making sure that the stuff I'm doing is sanitized and safe, and I just don't have to think about it. But I remember that was a pretty big effort at the time. The difference between the HTML4 and HTML5 sanitizers? Yeah, I think that's what I was remembering. 
there was a lot of discussion about it on, on one of the Rails releases back in the day. I don't know if it was like six or Oh, that one. Yeah. yeah. So that's when there was a lot of work that still needed to be done. So I think I mentioned earlier, Raphael and Casper had kind of re-implemented the whole sanitizer on top of Lufa. It wasn't perfect. It passed all the tests. But I think with anything that's as low level and touches all the bytes, like a sanitizer, there's always going to be edge cases. And so there was definitely some work that needed to go in to fix new vulnerabilities that we found and also fix some of the behavioral things. Gotcha. But maybe more interesting than that was the talk I gave at Rails World last year, which was about the HTML5 sanitizer. And this is if you have a valid HTML4 that gets sanitized as HTML4 and then rendered in a browser that thinks it's HTML5, you can actually introduce vulnerabilities that way. And so that was a whole big project too. So if people are interested in that, they can go back and look at my Rails World talk. We'll have to include a link to that in the show notes. Some other stuff I wanted to talk about too while we are here is you've been maintaining the SQLite gem for Mm -hmm. how long? Just a couple of years. Yeah, I got involved with the gem relatively late. So the SQLite gem was originally written in, God, I don't know, mid-2000s, 2005-ish probably. I think it was Jameis Buck, old school, who wrote it. And it's basically been the same API since then. It had not really changed at all. And just as an example of what hasn't changed Tender Love deprecated some calling conventions in 2010. And for 14 <laughs> years, we were emitting warnings saying, we're going to remove this real soon now. <laughs> and it didn't actually happen until earlier this year. We released 2.0 and actually removed all of that code that was deprecated. But I got involved relatively late, is my point. The gem has been around for a really long time. I got involved a couple of years ago because I wanted to help recompile the extension. SQLite is really interesting in that it's a relatively small amount of C code that you can just compile and embed anywhere, right? This is part of the magic of SQLite is you can embed it anywhere. But that one C file is actually really long. And for folks who maybe don't have experience with C compilers, if you have 50 files, you can compile them all in parallel and it's fast on modern machines. But if you have one C file, you're going to have one process that compiles that. And compiling SQLite, even on relatively new machines, can take... 20, 30 seconds. And so that was happening at like gem install time and it was annoying people. So I wanted to get involved in pre-compiling that. So that's when I really got involved with it. And then of course, this whole world opened up to me where I know nothing about SQLite. I guess I have to learn now. (laughs) And it's fun too, because the timing of Campfire and Writebook and Rails apps that are finally, it's fun to see, but when 37 signals uses MySQL and GitHub uses MySQL and whatever, then we get a lot of work invested into the MySQL support. And we get Trilogy and multiple database support and whatever. But when nobody was really using SQLite in production, it never really needed that much love. Right. But now there's a crazy amount of improvements and features. And Stephen Markheim has been doing a ton of stuff improving. Love like that performance guy. Performance and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. he's killing it. So yeah, it's definitely a magical time for SQLite. I ended up yeah. kind of joining the project at the right time when it needed a little bit of love. I've learned a ton. I've met people like Steven, who has taught me a lot. I think he'll tell you I taught him a lot, but it's actually the other way around. He's a very <laughs> kind person. And so him. here's the other interesting yeah. bit is there are multiple gems that support SQLite today, right? So there's SQLite 3, which is the one that I'm helping maintain, but there's also amalga light right and there's also extra mm. light and so there's a bunch of gems and maybe the interesting bit this isn't a secret or anything but the maintainers of all of those gems were in a discord chat talking about how can we work better together because it feels like with all the attention it would be great if we could collaborate and maybe there's one gem where we can take the best parts of all of these things and right. actually make that the official one and they all have different pros and cons right Amalga Light has all the features. All the WizBank features are turned on. And in Extra Light, we're just going to make it fast. And SQLite was kind of in between. And like, how are we going to handle the GVL with SQLite? And every gem has its own approach to how do you release that interpreter lock while you're doing long-lived transactions and things. So it's been a really interesting conversation. I've learned a lot from those folks already. And I think there's something magical that could happen. I don't think we're going to merge the gems necessarily, but maybe there's some 
approach that we can all agree on that allows us to reuse code or at least reuse an approach to how we handle locking the GVL that I think will be really great for the Ruby community and will really help everybody understand how to run SQLite, making it perform well. That's exciting. There's always two sides of the coin there where sometimes you need to start from scratch to try new ideas. And what happens if we just go all in on performance or support every single feature that might be not compatible with another approach? But then you have this, hopefully, situation where we've tried all these different things. Here's the pros and cons of each. What if we collaborate and share those bits of learning that maybe we're never going to be learned on just SQLite 3 because it's got its constraints. You're busy maintaining it for the things that you need for Rails or whatever it is, and you don't have the ability to like, well, if we wanted this, we'd have to rewrite or spend a month or more just focused on this one new approach just to see if it even makes any sense. And you kind of get the best of both worlds here where you can try crazy things, new approaches, whatever, and then collaborating back. And it's kind of the same Rails and Merb merging back in the day. Cross-pollination of ideas. Yeah, it does feel really exciting. Nice to see this level of energy and innovation in a stack that's as mature as Rails, I think. Yeah. I don't remember when 2 came out. I don't think it was super screamed in the change log about, look, it's pre-compiled now and you don't have to do it yourself. Because that's been a thing that has been annoying to me forever that I got to install the SQLite package on Ubuntu and then compile it. And it was one of the things I loved the most about Trilogy coming out. Boom. Don't worry about your MySQL headers. That stuff's already done for you. And I guess PG is kind of the only one left that doesn't have no dependency right. gem install. But I think that's right. Maybe that'll get solved at some point. I think the Trilogy gem, by the way, is fantastic. I've actually looked at that source code because we touched it a little bit while I was at Shopify. It's great. I love it. It Makes sense to me. Yeah, I poked around it not that long ago because of some sort of authentication change or something in MySQL recently that wasn't supported in Trilogy yet. And it is well-written. It's so cool to see a project like that that in a similar vein, we've seen... Well, I don't know that I ever had a chance to use the original MySQL gem, but then the MySQL 2 gem is what I've always used. And then it's being able to see now this is the latest iteration of an integration with MySQL. Look at all the stuff we learned over the years, all the stuff that's improved. We can build a gem now that connects to your database. It doesn't actually need a C extension to be compiled every time you install it, which if you go on Stack Overflow or Google, you will see the config options for gem install pasted everywhere. That's right. just yes. a part of the history of Ruby at this point. But yes, those posts will outlive you and me for sure. <laughs> yeah. If only we could have started with Trilogy at the beginning, but well, this is all the stuff that we've learned. And yeah. now we can build something like that, which saves new developers an enormous amount of time and senior and up. Those people don't have to think about this stuff anymore. They can go worry about more important problems. I think one of the interesting things about Trilogy also is it's just a much simpler code base. It reminded me a little bit of... I'm struggling to remember the name of the project, but it's the SSL project that was started by like the BSD folks where they just removed a bunch of things from the code base. Oh, interesting. I can't remember. Either you remember the name. I tried Googling for it just now. I can't find it. But basically, we're going to rip out the code for TLS 1.0 because you shouldn't be using that anyway. And I feel like Trilogy was, we're going to build this thing. It's going to fit our use case for how to talk to, what are the features a web application needs? We'll build it with just with those and that's it. Yeah, that's the strange thing about backwards compatibility. In some cases, it is the best thing ever. We've been able to upgrade Rails for so long that I remember the two to three, three to four, those upgrades were pretty painful back in the day. But since sure. six, five, two, I don't remember, like they've all been just so easy over the recent years. You take it for granted because it's too easy. You don't have to struggle with it. You just upgrade. And maybe there's a struggle of upgrading your front end to Hotwire. That, sure, you're going to have to rewrite a bunch of stuff if you want to do that. But 
You don't have to do that part. The Rails backend has all been pretty darn magical to upgrade over the past few years. Been amazed. Yeah, I agree. It's a hard thing to accomplish. I can't remember. You've got a bunch of other projects too, open source stuff. Well, we've touched I don't know on if it's a bunch. We've touched on the big ones. Is there any other ones? The other thing that I work on tends to be all the tool chain used for pre-compiling C extensions, right? We mm. just talked about, oh, it's so much easier with SQLite and Nokagiri started pre-compiling a few years ago and the tools that are used oh, right. for that. So there's like Rake Compiler Doc, which is a container environment that lets you cross-compile. On my Linux machine here, I can build Mac OS and Windows binaries inside of a Docker container. And that's been really interesting. I've learned way more than I wanted to about (laughs) cross-compiling and how libraries get resolved on these different operating systems. But that's been super fun and super rewarding to work on. That's really, really good. We'll have to include a link to that because I don't imagine most people have spent much time on... I've never done native C extension in a... Gen- well, I did one for fun, I think, just yeah. to learn the basics. It's a little bit of a niche skill, for sure. You don't need to know it to be productive in Ruby, for sure. Yeah. But it's also one of those things that if you want a deep, fast integration with something, that might be your only option. If you want it might to be. do that, well... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the FFI project has really gotten better over the last 10 years. If I had to do it over again, I think I would give that second look for some of the C extensions I have. I'm not very familiar with it. How's oh. that compared to like building the SQLite gem with its own C extension? Yeah. The idea is that from Ruby, you can call that C function directly. And you don't need to write your own C extension that speaks Ruby to live in between. Mm. Maybe the disadvantage of that approach is that you're relying on FFI to marshal all of your parameters, both your inputs and your outputs to the function, which may not be great or efficient code, to be completely honest, especially with string handling. String handling in like the JVM for JRuby is a little hard to predict at times. But the advantage is then you get to write all of your code in Ruby and then you turn on YJIT. And you see how fast it can go. And I think that I really encourage people to spike it both ways and benchmark it to see if, do you really need to write the C extension in between? Or can you actually just call it straight from Ruby? Which one is faster for your use case? A really great example of this is the crypt gem uh, written by Martin Boslett many years ago, where it's a binding for OpenSSL. And the way it works is you make one call into C, and it does a bunch of time intensive CPU intensive operations and then hands you a value back. But you're only making that C call once. And so it doesn't right. matter if it's slow to marshal because you're only doing it once. And then on the flip side, I think there's a gem like Nokagiri where you're making a lot of C function calls. And so you want to be very, very careful about how you do that. And you don't want to necessarily have to go back and forth between Ruby and C a lot because that's the blood brain barrier that ends up being a real performance strain. But if you can do it once and get an answer back, like encrypt, FFI is really, really good at that use case. And for everything else, I just encourage people to benchmark before they say, I need to write this in C because YJIT is really great. And the more code you can keep in Ruby, the better off we'll be long-term, I think. Yeah, the work on YJIT is just insane how much performance we've gotten out of it. And I also really liked uh, one thing I don't think people really realize is Rails will enable YJIT if it can now in Rails 7.2, but what's cool about it is where it turns on YJIT. It's not immediately on Ruby boot. It's not on. It waits because the comment in the pull request or whatever was basically, let's wait until all the Rails initializer stuff is done. We don't need to optimize that. We need to optimize your application code. So we'll skip after all the initializing is done and then we'll turn on YJIT so it can focus on your code instead of initializer code that doesn't matter or whatever, because it will, like you said, run once and you don't need to optimize that. Super, super smart. I had never thought of that until I read that. And I was like, oh, this is great. It's just such a cool thing. We also don't have to go into our hosting platform and turn on the YJIT environment variable. You don't even think about it. That's another cool thing. We can just use Ruby to turn on features of Ruby while it's running, which is Awesome, because I think a lot of times you would 
first implement that as a flag that needs to be run when Ruby starts and then it doesn't turn on until now you can turn it on later or whatever. But that's another little small genius idea that yeah. makes for a great thing. So yeah, I have to give a shout out to Jean Boussier, who is my former coworker at Shopify. And he's the one who was really pushing for the ability to turn Widget on after boot. He's the one who pushed for that feature to get built into Widget. Did all the research on Shopify's apps in production to show that it was going to be better for memory usage and better for performance. He did an incredible amount of work behind the scenes to make that happen. And he's also doing something similar for garbage collection coming up where you can turn off the garbage collector in Ruby during boot and then turn it back on. And so he's wow. been playing with a lot of those options. He's doing a fantastic job behind the scenes. So Jean, if you're listening, and I know you're not. Thank you. <laughs> I remember it was his comment in the commit or whatever that this is why we're going to enable it after initialize. And I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. so smart. Yeah. That's cool. And then what's also awesome is us little guys building small applications get experience from Shopify who can think through these big problems at scale. And then we get those benefits pretty much for free because it makes so much sense for them to figure it out. And we yeah. just get that advantage. So it's nice. Cool. Thanks, Uncle Toby. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anything else you want to cover? We've been going for about an hour. I want to take up too much of your time until we Jessica. get hacking on some scrubber stuff. I'm going to reach out. Yeah. It's on my to-do list for this month, so I will definitely ping you. Perfect. Andrew, you got anything else? It didn't really fit in the conversation, but I did have one question, and that's you've been writing Ruby since 2008. I won't mention where I was in 2008, but... I'm just curious, what keeps you in the community? Why not switch to Elixir? Like, why do you still write Ruby all these years later? It's a good question. In my career, I've written a handful of languages. And Ruby is just the one that clicked for me. Like, it's kind of how my brain works. It matches how I think about solving problems really well. Of course, we probably co-evolved, right? My brain evolved to think in Ruby as I used it more often. But I still write code in other languages, but Ruby just matches me. Even more than that, though, is I feel like the Ruby community, once you start to build relationships and you start to understand what's motivating people. I worked at a bunch of companies that really embraced test-driven development. And that blossomed in the Ruby community in a way that it didn't in, call it C. Nobody in C tests. If they test anything, they shout at the Google test framework and get away with the minimal tests. <laughs> I really like you have a conversation about what should the thing do when you're ready to test. And that's something that's in the Ruby community. And I'm sure it's in the Elixir community as well. And I know a lot of people who've moved over into Clojure or Elixir or Go and these languages borrowed a lot from Ruby, but I'm also old. And so maybe I'm just at that point in my life where I'm like, eh, I have a limited number of years and a limited number of new languages I can learn and I'm happy here. So why not invest and continue to build those relationships and contribute? Does do that answer your that question? It does. Do you think that all programmers need to go through the management track in order to become, quote unquote, an elite level programmer? Or do you think that there is becoming room for some of us to skip that track and continue just being engineers? I think that being a manager for even a brief while allows you to look at problems with a different pair of glasses. It gives you a different perspective. And so I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of really great developers who had never been in management roles, right? So I look at Aaron Patterson as a great example. And for those of us who are not Aaron, right? I think being a manager teaches us to think about problems from a perspective of, is this the most important problem we could be solving right now? Instead of, I have this problem, I'm going to solve it as well as I can. You can end up solving the wrong problem really well that way. And I think being a manager for me at least helped me take a step back and look at those problems from a slightly higher perspective. And especially when I was at Shopify, it helped me think about, well, we could go work on this problem, but is that going to help Shopify? Like put on my business hat and think about, should this be our highest priority? Or if it is our highest priority, how is it going to impact the business? And those things made me a better developer, is I guess my point. Being able to think uh, like a meta level, popping the stack once or twice, actually made me a better engineer because it taught me I can solve this problem in a crappy way and move on with my life because I know the code's not going to get touched anymore and it's not that important. 
it helped me figure out prioritization a little bit. Management definitely gives you a different perspective on things, but I absolutely do not think that that should be required for people to become senior engineers. But I also want to separate management from leadership. So some people conflate management and leadership. Management is some of the things I talked about, like how should this apply to the business and where are we going to spend our budget and making sure people get feedback. Leadership can also be, is this the most important problem we need to solve? How are we solving it? How many people should work on it? Should we let scope float and fix time or do the opposite? Those are all like leadership things that I would expect senior engineers to do anyway. And so I think there are some valuable skills to learn there, but you can learn them without having to be in a manager role. I like that distinction too of management and leadership. If someone's a principal engineer, you expect them to be able to think about not just their work, but the whole team. And how does this affect? We're being asked as an engineering team to go build this feature. We should be able to push back and think about the investment that the company wants to make. Are we trying something new? Should we go all in on it? Should we not? Should we try and test it? Being able to think about how does this affect the business? I've found that in the like startup space. Those people, and I think Matt Swanson called them product engineers with that emphasis on they care about the business and how yeah. engineering fits into the whole thing. Because right. I there's think a if sense of tried to, ownership, right? There's a sense of yeah. ownership. Even if you're not the owner of the company, you still have a sense of urgency and ownership over how things are going to turn out. Yeah. And I think if anybody's been in a small startup, the realization you might run into that I've definitely had is the engineering stuff. We can build whatever you ask for, but we have to make sure we have the budgets to build that. And that either is coming from investors or our customers. And we have to make decisions based on what resources do we have and how's that going to affect our long term and all that stuff. There's a lot of other little things that come into play when you're just thinking about You could either think about just the code and that's all I want to care about. It's like, whatever you ask me to go build, I'll do it and I'll do it as best as I can. Mm -hmm. But there's a level to that that you can go up above and say like, okay, if we want to go this direction, how do we do that best today, in a year, in 10 years, whatever. And you can think about all of those kind of things at once or whatever. It's definitely a skill that takes time and you have to like be capable of writing your code first or whatever. And then you can stack on to that over time and add some of those higher level things. I feel like you don't have to do that from day one. Agreed. Well said. Final thing I want to say is thank you. Because if it's not clear to everyone who's now listening, we are all benefiting from your work on a daily basis, especially if we're Rails engineers. So thank you for all your work. That's very kind of you to say. Thank you. That's kind. People like to wake up in the morning and do a Sudoku puzzle. I wake up and I go, oh my God, somebody is entity escaping their ampersand. I guess for me, it's the same kind of puzzle where I like to just dig in and maybe if people benefit, that's a great outcome too. I can't reiterate that enough of what Andrew said. A lot of the work that you're doing is kind of the invisible work that happens that we just take advantage of and Rails is secured by default. Great. Why is it? It's because people like you put the time in for our benefit and I'm sure that you probably get more bug reports than thank yous. So this is our chance to give you some of those thank yous to try and catch up. Thank you both. That's very kind. I appreciate it. Well, thanks a ton for joining us. I think we'll call it here. Lovely conversation. I'm sure we'll be hanging out more, doing some scrubber stuff soon. Great to see you both. Are you going to be at Rails World? Yes. We'll be there for sure. I'll see you there. Are you going to uh, RubyConf as well? I plan to. I haven't bought my plane ticket yet, but I bought my conference ticket. I haven't Excellent. bought my plane ticket to Rails World yet. That's details. Yeah, I don't think I have either. I should probably do that. <sighs> you but know. if you need to, you can drive. It's fine. Right. Exactly. You might just have to go a few days earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I've driven across the country. It can't be that far, right? You'd have to drive across two countries. <laughs> can't be worse than driving through West Texas. Oof. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll catch you later. Great. Thanks both. See ya. Bye.